Arise Conference. So there are about uh, 20 of us who attended the Arise Conference. I was the eld oldest, and Eva was the youngest. <laughs> I know. So yeah, so it was great. So we've asked uh, Migs Raynon to share his testimony. So we're going to ask Migs to come here. Hi everyone, my name is Migs Raynon, and I'm here to share with you a life-changing experience because I, I attended the Rice Conference in Wellington last July with others from CCF. Before going to Wellington, I did not really know what was going to happen, but I knew that it would be a great time with Christian friends. I, expected, I, I was expecting some lessons from the speakers that somehow would help me be more intimate with God, but that we can surpass all my expectations. Little did I know that God would, would really stir my heart to become the kind of person he wants me to be. So there were about 6,000 people with 1,900 volunteers for two, from 230 different churches that filled the TSB Arena and Michael Farrell Center for three days. I was amazed how God brought us all together and appointed us to worship and honor him. I sensed the pure joy and peace in the, in the midst of these thousands of Christians. I would high-five people around me whom I didn't even know. We were from different places and different churches, but we were worshiping the same God. The theme of the conference was Hear Our Voices. The messages were centered around how God would hear our prayers and the challenge to step out of our comfort zones to extend God's kingdom. Our prayers are like seeds that grow and change hatred to love, intimidation to boldness, and selfishness to selflessness. And for me, the le um, lessons for me as a young Christian, one of the key lessons that really stood out was that as humans, we are sinful, stubborn, and unworthy of His grace. And also, the enemy hates to see me grow in the Word of God, and he will do everything to take a foothold in my life. But God gives me His unfailing love, and He's bigger than everything. I should dwell on communing with God so that I can highly appreciate the gift of salvation He gave me. During one of the praise and worship, there was a moment of stillness in my heart. God spoke to me that I should stop worrying and focusing on, th on worldly things. Instead, I must focus my heart and mind on Him. Pastor Brian Houston quoted Colossians 3, 2, which says, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. I realized that my time is so precious and that I should spend it with God and for His purposes. I cannot carry, carry God's purpose for me if I just plan out on my own without considering His will. Yes, my willpower might take me to some place, but if I ask God's guidance, He will work in my life and make all things possible in His glory. And the real test is how I'm going to apply the lessons I learned now that I'm back in Auckland. I know there's a real battle waiting for me. In Joshua 1, 9, it says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The week after the conference, Bojo invited me to student to join student life it's a christian organization at university here uni students boldly share the gospel to fellow students on campus at first i was hesitant but i realized this is a perfect opportunity for me to be obedient on what god has been commanding me to do sharing the gospel wholeheartedly with random people sets my spirit to be bold and courageous i know that nothing will be wasted because god will cause the growth of those seeds that i planted it's a great joy to be used for this expansion of his kingdom so far, it's been a fantastic journey with God, not letting a day pass without acknowledging how great my God is. Being prayerful gives me a full access to Him, and it assures me that He is present in my life. I encourage all of you to keep growing in the Lord. Let's participate in these kind of events where we can feed our spirits with powerful and touching messages, then apply the lessons when we get back. Let us be a church that exists for God's purposes. To God be all the glory. So we'd like to pray for Migs. His D group leader is Angelo, but he has work right now. So I've asked also Bojo to come here and we will pray for Migs. Okay. So we praise God for these men. We praise God for Migs. We praise God for D group leaders that um, mentor Migs. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the life of Migs, Lord. 
Indeed, Lord, you are the God that goes beyond our expectations. We thank you, Lord, that um, from what you expected to be just a fun event and some learnings would, would become a life-transforming event for him, Lord. And Lord, we know, Lord, that uh, we thank you for all the things that he learned. And now, Lord, that he's back in Auckland, indeed, this is the place where he needs to apply the lessons. We pray, Lord, that he will not lose the passion and he will really make a difference, O oh God, wherever you bring him. And you will protect him, Lord, against the evil one who will try to discredit his testimony or make him lose his passion for sharing the gospel, evangelizing, and reaching out even to strangers. Give him the boldness, Lord, that comes from you. Oh Lord, uh, we thank you, Lord, for Bojo and Angelo. We thank you for their lives, for their desire, Lord, to, to uh, disciple people like Migs. Pray, Lord Father, that uh, he too, Lord, will be filled with your spirit and wisdom so that he will know uh, how to lead Migs and the other members of their D group, O oh God, towards you. So, Lord, thank you, Lord, for this Sunday service. Lord, we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, for the next gen Sunday school that is happening downstairs. We pray, Lord Father, that you transform their lives, O God, and may you bless supernaturally all the volunteers, O Lord, so that they will speak your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the finances of this church. Thank you, Lord, that you are the one that is providing for us. Lord, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you allow us, Lord, to give cheerfully and faithfully, knowing, Lord, that we just want to return what is dutifully yours. So thank you, Lord Jesus. And now we pray, Lord, for the rest of our Sunday service. We pray, Lord, for our brother Paul, Lord, that you will just override all his preparation, Lord, according to your will, so that he will simply speak your message and your message alone. Thank you, Father God. Bless the rest of our time. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, thank you. All right, so we're going to ask um, Brother Paul to be here on stage. He just celebrated his birthday last week. He's now... What? Centennial? <laughs> Just joking. Divided by? Divided by two. All right. I should not tell his age, okay? It's not 50. Okay. All right. So let's welcome Brother Paul. All right. Thank you, Pastor Ryan, for revealing everything. <laughs> You're so kind. I'm really blessed when Mix mentioned something about spiritual battle. You know, it's real. When I was preparing this message, I had all these kind of uh, people annoying. I, I was sick Monday, and I was just, you know, I couldn't prepare. I couldn't focus. And uh, it was a busy week as well. There were ma many meetings. And uh, the car breaks down. Uh, something in the house breaks down. So n for no apparent reason. <laughs> but praise God. We are still alive. The enemy cannot overcome Christ. Right? Okay. All right. So, yes. Praise God. I thought, I thought the projector won't work again. The last time I did was it was really failing. Praise God for that. God is faithful. Nobody can stop us because God is on our side. So, for the past few weeks, we were studying this acrostic love. Right? We have finished L, and now we are in the process of, you know, doing the O. Love, love God and others. The O is obey God's word and appointed leaders. Okay? And what's good about this is that obeying God's word really would lead you to worshiping Him more. The more you obey Him, the more you would learn how to uh, worship Him and respect Him. Why is that? Well, we would learn that today, and we have joined it with loving, obeying God's word with his appointed leaders. So the title of our message today is Honor Authority, Be a Blessing. Let's say that together, please. Honor Authority, Be a Blessing. Why do we need to honor authority? Let's put that into perspective. What do you mean when you say honor? What I'm going to do is that I'm going to show you some images in the projector and tell me where you would put this in your house or in your room. Right? First is this. If you're familiar, you know, you know uh, Babe Ruth? Right? This is his first jersey that he used when he, he played 
in the Yankees. All right? First jersey. And before I tell you how much it costs when it was bidded in 2012, where would you put this? So just put it in your mind. You don't have to shout aloud. All right? The buyer who bought this bought it for 4.4 US million dollars. Right? That's US 4.4. If you were the one who bought this, where would you put this in your house? Would you put it in your garage? Just put it in your storage just to rot? Maybe you'll frame it, right? About this. This is a ball that was signed by Michael Jordan and Michael Jackson <laughs> doing a music video. All right? And this was auctioned. And do you know how much it cost? cost 294000 Not as high as the other one, but it's only a ball. <laughs> All right. And you're buying 294 US dollars. Now, in the New Zealand context, we have this painting. Do you know Charles Frederick Goldie? Have you gone to Auckland Museum lately? This museum, this painting is gone. This is what they sold early last year. It is by a famous painter, Charles Frederick Goldie. He had many of these paintings with Maori, old Maori people. They are actually leaders, right, of tribe. And he would paint them. And this is the most expensive one. The cheapest one which was sold from his painting was 90,000 New Zealand dollars. What do you think? How much do you think the per, uh, uh, the, this, this uh, painting sold for? A million, right? Close. It's 1.4 million New Zealand dollars. It's more than three times my house. <laughs> right? It's really expensive. I couldn't live in that painting. But if I bought that painting, maybe it wouldn't you know, fit in my house because it's just too expensive. All right? So that's the meaning of honor. When you honor something, you put it in a special spot. When you buy these things, for example, you are the one who won the bidding, you would not just place it in your garage or in a place where it would rot. Right? You would take care of it, and really honor it. That's the perspective of, of honor. You know, a title of our message again today is, Honor Authority, Be a Blessing. I was given a chance of uh, actually seeing some, you know, have you gone to some funerals? Where some people would do a eology, right? They would tell about all the good things that the person has done in his life, you know, really praising him, telling him, or telling him, even if he's dead, that you, <laughs> you know, you've really done many things in my life and you've impacted my life. Well, last Sunday, I was actually a recipient of that, a eulogy. Well, no, uh, we have this D12 and uh, Pastor Ryan wants us to honor each other. All right? So it was not a eulogy. It was more like <laughs> they, they wanted to honor me. But not for me to feed my ego, but for me to be encouraged, to continue working, and just serving our God. So I don't know if they were thinking like maybe I was a dead person. That's why they were saying, oh, th they were really saying sweet words. <laughs> were you thinking that I was dead? <laughs> no? Okay, that's good. Well, I'm dead really. Dead to sin? Alive in Christ. <laughs> All right. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, true. All right. So eology is honoring. But what if you honor persons actually when they're alive? Would that impact for the people around you? Of course it would. In 1 Peter 2, 13 to 14, it says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as to the one in authority or to governors as sent by him. See that highlighted uh, statement? Sent by him who? Sent by God. For the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. So, if you think about it, this verse is... Every authority is sent by God. They are sent by God to pass judgment onto you if you do evil. And they are also sent by God to praise you if you do right. Ladies and gentlemen, what this verse is saying is we have to honor authority regardless. In the following verses, 15 to 17, it continues and says, For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. 
So not all authorities would be good. Some of them would be foolish men. And yes, it says here, you should submit to them as the previous verses. For what reason? For them to be silent, even in their foolishness. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as a fun slave of God. So when you are submitting to this people, to this authority, you are submitting to them because you are a bond slave of God. In actual fact, you are doing this because you know that God commanded you to obey them, and therefore in obedience to God, you obey your authorities, your leaders, right? The people who you've, you've been a subject to, or you are a subject to. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. You see, we should honor the king not only if they are respectable, but also if they are unreasonable. Okay? Don't honor people or authorities just because they are good. You are just repaying back what they given to you. But what the word, the Bible, what God is saying is that even if they do evil to you, do them good. Is that hard or is that easy? Hard. Yeah. Christian life is not hard. It's impossible. All right? We always say that it's impossible. Without God, you cannot live the Christian life. And that's why the first step is really to receive Jesus Christ in your heart. Without Him, you cannot do this. And you see also, there's, there's an example by David. So you can see the heart of David. There, there came a time wherein Saul thought that David was taking the throne. He thought that if, Dave, if, if I have won uh, or killed 1,000 men and David had 10,000, he might as well get the throne. And you know, in the process, Saul started to hunt for David. So David ran away because he's going to get killed, right? With some men, of course. And there was a time when David was hiding in a cave. Saul came into that same place and wanted to rest. Went inside the cave not knowing that David was there and his men in one of the recesses of the cave. See, a cave can be complex, right? It's not just a straight funnel. There could be some channels which are recesses. And in one of those recesses, David was there. And when they saw Paul in that cave, you know what he did? In this verse, 1 Samuel 24, 10, he had that opportunity to kill Paul, a uh, soul, not me. All right. <laughs> so he had that opportunity, and his men were saying, kill him. This is your time. And he said, in verse 10, Behold, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord had given you today in my hand. This is now David talking after the fact. So what happened here was Saul went out of the cave. Oh, David went out of the cave. Then Saul woke up and went, went out of the cave as well. So they were not talking face to face, okay? There's a little distance behind them. Remember, Saul is trying to kill David. So David would have to have that safety net, which would, have, would be a couple of distances. But... In a, in a way that they could speak to each other. So that's the setting. And David said, so I have all this opportunity, right? This day your eyes have seen that the Lord had given you today in my hands, in the cave. And some said to kill you. His men were telling, kill Saul. But my eye had pity on you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. You see, David did not even touch Saul because he knows that it is sin to go against God's anointed. I had this, uh, well, I, I, in New Zealand, I moved from one company, not the company to another. Uh, such is the practice in the IT industry. You move from place to place just because there's a shortage, all right? And in one of these companies that I moved to, the, I had this kind of manager who, he, he's not really bad. But there came a day that he was in a bad mood. And there was this question in his mind, trying to understand the system that he could not answer by himself. And he came to me and asked. And in my first few years here in New Zealand, I was really a fumbler. Until now, I do fumble a couple of times. And I also had a, tar a hard time explaining myself. So in the process, I annoyed him. You know, and then 
he started to raise his voice. He started to shout, it's like before me were the gates of hell. You know, I, I can really feel the lashing, you know, those, those bad words coming out, those foul words. But I, I was just calm and trying to explain as hard as I can. In the end, he got it, right? He got it. But I was thinking to myself, Lord, Father God, forgive him, for he does not know what he's doing. So he, he's asking about this many things and lashing about me, but I just want to glorify and honor you. So I, I didn't answer back. I just kept on explaining. But when everything was already explained, I went to my table. I was devastated, you know. I was devastated. I feel like I was maltreated. I feel like I'm not a person anymore. But of course, that's only a momentary, a momentary thinking. In the end, I got myself back and said, Lord, you're in control. I don't care what he has said, but I know that he's my leader. I would respect him anyway. So I submitted to him whatever he was asking for as long as it is in, in, you know, in the Lord. I, you know what happened? After a few years, when I was to move to another company, I prayed who would be my referrals. I got this guy. And uh, in my next job, while I was signing the contract, the uh, agent told me, you know what? Th that person, your, refer your reference, has told many good things about you. Oh, really? And, uh, oh, that's, that's that maybe a little light, right? But there was a secondary statement in taking, I hope that you would do the same in your next company. So that made me afraid because I'll have to expect more shouting and gnashing of teeth. So, <laughs> oh. Anyway, yes. So submit to authorities even if they are unreasonable because in due time, you will reap the rewards. But don't think about the rewards. Think about obeying your God who has the best interest in your mind. All right? So submission in that verse in 1 Peter 2.13 when you say submit, in Greek, it is hupo taso. Can we say that together? Hupo taso. Alright? Hupo taso is just, you know, aligning yourself to the authorities. You put yourself under them. So submission in, is trusting God. This is the definition that uh, I think is appropriate to this. Submission is trusting that God is able to accomplish His will and purpose in your life to those He has placed in authority over you. Even if their intent is evil. In the end, God would accomplish His purpose. You know, when this verse was being written, you know Emperor Nero, have you heard about him in history? This guy looks at himself in the mirror like this. Okay, he's, he's a bit fat. But he's handsome. I don't know how that, can that be, but he's handsome. All right, he, he looks at himself, and you know what he did? He's really a ruthless emperor. What he did was to burn a city and blame the Christians for burning that city. What more? So he blamed the Christians. He also ordered the beheading of some of them. So they were beheaded. And he went the extra mile of actually getting the heads of these Christians, putting oil on their head, put it, put it in his garden, and light them up. It was lighting for his garden. That's how ruthless this person is. And yet, in the time of Paul and Peter, they were saying, submit to authority. Submit to this kind of authority. Submit to the king. Can you imagine that? Instead of them saying, let's revolt, let's stand up for our rights, they said, submit to what God has installed as authority. Can you take that, guys? Isn't God unfair? What do you think? But God is not unfair. He has higher purposes which we do not understand. Our minds are just too limited to understand what's happening around us. And therefore, we always have to trust Him regardless of what's happening. So submission to the authorities can accomplish God's work regardless of what you think. In Romans 13, 1 to 3, it says here, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. That now also supports our statement that everything comes from God, and He is the one who established all authority. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God and they have opposed, will receive condemnation upon, upon themselves. Resist here, if you can guess, is, if his submission is huputaso, resist in the Greek word is antitaso. You are against God. 
And in actual fact, in 1 Samuel 15, 23, it says, this is Saul now. So the context of this is Saul was not able to wake for Samuel, and Samuel rebuked him. In one of these statements, Samuel told to Saul, For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is an iniquity and idolatry. Can you see, can you imagine how bad to resist your leaders? It is equivalent to divination, witchcraft. Well, it's not maybe not similar, but it is the same in terms of faith. Can you understand that? It's like I'm not smoking, but if I get angry too many times, it's like I'm smoking as well. The effect on me is that uh, is that great, all right? So that it, this is what it is describing: that the effect of rebellion against your leaders is as the same as the sin of divination, and insubordination is idolatry. That's how heavy it is when you resist your leaders. So don't oppose your leaders. Don't oppose them. For in the end, ultimate authority is God. Isaiah 45, 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and, and there is no other. He is the one who established all authorities, and therefore, when you are submitting to the authority, look to God and say, Lord, no matter how hard it is for me to submit to this person, please help me so that I can obey your will. All right? You submit to earthly authorities. But what if they are corrupt? What if, let's say, I was in the age of Hitler. Would you submit to his command? There was this uh, example in Nuremberg trials. You know, Nuremberg is a place in Germany. All right? Anybody been in Germany before? Nobody? That's good. I've, not, I've never been there. But you know, there was a war trial in 1945 to 1946. So they were now trying all the, the Nazis, these guys who were involved in the Holocaust. So they transported, one of them was Adolf Eichmann. So he was the one who organized the logistics of transporting the Jews to the concentration camps. And that's where they, were, they suffered, they were burned, they were killed. So this Eichmann, he said, as one of his uh, statements, I did that because I was only following orders from Adolf Hitler, from the government from that time. And yet what happened? Was he justified? He was submitting to the authorities. But you know what the judge said? Yes, you have followed orders. But isn't it that we have higher laws than the order? Even in human terms, we have higher laws than the order. International laws that say we should kill with proper setting, with a proper setting, only in war. But in this case, you were causing genocide. But God's law is higher than any other law. And therefore, you have to look to that law and you would realize that what you're doing is wrong. So, if these guys did not escape it, how more about us? So, what we are saying here is that when you obey, when you submit, it should not be blind submission. When you submit, you have to really know that you are submitting in accordance to God's word. And that is why it is very important for you to know God and to know His word. How can you obey God? How can you submit to the authorities in a proper way if you do not make yourself available to God to know Him? If you do not go and read your Bible every day to know what God is saying in His word. Let us look at Psalm, verse, uh, Psalm 19. So what I did was to create a matrix, basically dividing... Psalm 19, verse 7, 8, 9, into a description of God's Word, the characteristic of God's Word, and the effect. So these three verses actually would give you a very wide description of what God's Word is. In Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, in matrix form, the law of the Lord, characteristic, is perfect, and effect, it is storing the soul. 
The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. In the next verse, it says, The precepts of the Lord is right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And in the last verse, it says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Judge, the judgment of the Lord is true, are true, and they are righteous altogether. You know what this is saying? Especially in the first part, in verse, if you go back to that, in uh, verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. It is perfect, guys. You know when the time that you have received Jesus Christ and you have known Jesus Christ because of His Word, wasn't your soul restored to the relation that you, that you have in, in, in God? That you have known that all your sins were forgiven because of Him. Weren't you dis restored? So God's Word is perfect. If we only put that in our minds and hearts and really seek Him as well, not only knowing in mind and heart, but really doing your part. Your part to read your Bible every day and know the God who saved you. Don't stop when you've known Christ. Don't stop there. You should continue. It's a journey that you should walk through this lifetime. And I was really struck by this, this uh, Psalm 1 last, last Sunday. And I want to repeat it this Sunday again. Let's go, back, uh, let's go to that verse. In Psalm 1 it says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in. That's the first step. It is actually a progression, right? So you walk in the counsel of the wicked, then after that, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. So let's, play, let's talk about Janki. Let's say, I, I, for, uh, at some point in time, I'd say, I, I love what Janki is doing, right? Then many people I, I heard were saying bad things about him. So I, I kind of say, oh, I want to listen what they're talking about. And I went to this guy. So that it's walking in. Then they were saying, oh, you know, this junkie is not really good because he's selling, he's privatizing many companies. And therefore, he's not really thinking about our country. But he is, right? But if you look at that side only of him taking our money because he's privatizing companies, then maybe you would be persuaded. The next you would do is stand in the path of sinners. So you would now try to listen what they are saying and gather more information and just, you know, transforming yourself towards their direction as well. So now you become part of them. And in the end, you would be sitting with them, mocking your authority as well, your leader. But as Christians, we should not be doing that. What we should be doing is delighting in the law of the Lord and if we sense that there's something wrong in what they're saying, it is not for us to take offense, nor maybe to defend our leader. It is for us to pray for them. When you hear somebody talking bad about your leader, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. But you respect them anyway. And the way to show respect is by saying to these guys, you know, maybe we have a corrupt leader, but we should pray for them instead so that they would woke up. They would wake up and know the thing they're doing wrong. Don't add in to the fire. If there's a fire, don't fuel it. But you should be the one who should be pouring water for that to stop. Be careful. Because if you're not careful, you would fall into the trap and actually sin against your authority, against God in the end. In Titus 3, verse 1 to 2, it says here, Remind them, this is Paul talking to Titus, in his letter, he's saying, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. You know, we have that tendency that somebody is already being aligned, you join in. You should not. The Bible says you should not malign anybody, even your neighbor, even your friend, but most especially your leaders. If junkie is being maligned, being, you know, they're destroying his figure, you should not be part of that, but rather saying, the Lord has appointed him, let us see where he's going to be, and let us pray, pray for him to support his projects, so that God's will may be shown in New Zealand. God's will may be done in New Zealand, right? 
That's what we should, we should be doing. We don't join the group who are saying bad things about our rulers. You know, there are many spheres of authority. So we have the family. We also have the local church. We have the workplace and school. We have our government. In all these spheres, we have a follower. Also, we have authority. Okay? The, the follower needs to honor the authority. Regardless, as we have discussed a while ago, regardless if they're good or bad. The authority, however, on the other hand, would be accountable to God. So don't worry if you're some beating to a person who's so ruthless. Let's say in your job, they're not treating you that well. You have done everything you can and yet they blame you of something you've not done. Keep on respecting them. You know, when, when somebody makes a mistake, they would come to blame you, right? Instead of, you know, lashing back. Say, forgive me if I've done anything wrong, but I would try to fix what you think I've done wrong. But I'm telling you, I've not d done it wrong. Just, just for record's sake. Do it in respect. Don't do it in anger. When you're angry, actually pull out. And when you're calm, go back to him and say, I, I want to really respect you. You are my leader. You are the one who's leading this company towards a place that we want to become, to be. And I believe in what you're doing. All right? I believe it. But, but if he did something wrong, you could say, but, you know, I think this is wrong. You can say it in a nice way. Don't be afraid. I've done it a couple of times. All right? And the, the results are probably not that pleasing every time. But it's okay. Because I want to please God. In all those transactions that I had, I would always go back at home and I would just pray because I know they, in the morning they would come back with something else. It's always something new. But not everything is negative though. Some things come positive. And I praise God all the more. Regardless of what happens, I praise God. Negative or neg positive result, I just praise God because He's the one moving things. He's the one in control. He's the one in charge, not the person I'm talking to, right? So if I just focus on my God, I know He would take care of it. In the first fear that we have in family, the wives. Who are the wives here? Can you please raise your hand? Oh, we, we only have a few. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> wives in Colossians 3.18, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. You see that? Ooh, yes. <laughs> the husband. As fitting in the Lord. So they're, if they ask for a cup of coffee... You know, you say, yes, honey. <laughs> that should be your reaction. Not, oh, you're, you're big enough to make your own coffee. <laughs> I'm doing the laundry. Why should you? No, you should not be doing that. Treat them with respect. You know that the husband is the one, in, is the authority. Is it below? <laughs> it's the authority of the wife. That correct? And this is what God's word is saying. So you should learn to submit. On the other hand, husbands, don't be too fast. <laughs> you should love your wife. All right, there was, there was this uh, husband who went home one day and said, Oh, you know, I've learned that you should submit to me. You know, from the time that he told that to her wife, he did not see her wife for two weeks. Yes, two weeks. And, you know, after two weeks... His swollen eyes started to open. He saw he, her, husband, her, her wife again. You know, swollen. He had black eye. <laughs> so, for two weeks, he was not able to see his wife. <laughs> All right? <laughs> her wife. <laughs> okay. It's a joke. <laughs> I hope you get it. <laughs> Children. Okay, this is good. Children, obey your parents. Let's read the verse. Ephesians 6, 1 to 3. Let's, uh, I, I want the children to read this together with me. Is that alright? Let's read this. And read it from your heart, okay? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. 
Wow. Did you understand what that verse is saying? It may go wet with you. That's the blessing. On the other hand, if you really want to obey your parents, do it not only in words, do it in action. In yesterday's DLA, our D group leaders assembly, I was really blessed by this Elevate team. They put in their one of their action items because the question was, what what can you do to make your D group more loving? Something like that. In that that essence, all right? And one of their statements was, "Don't be a consumer." Elevate. Are you consumers in your house, or you want? <laughs> Is that statement only for your D group and not applicable in your house? When your mother or your father is have, are doing chores, do you help them out? Or do you only honor them in your lips? When you see them so busy and so tired, do you go to them and approach them, what can I do to help? Or maybe do you ask them, how are you? And follow it up by, how are you really? Did you have that communication lately with your parents? If not, today, can you please apply that? in your life. Honor your parents by going to them and helping them in actual fact, not only in words. All right? Can we do that, Elevate? Yes. Praise God. Praise God. All right. Uh, don't, don't shoot me, okay? I'm, I'm only a messenger. <laughs> we also pray for the church leaders. In First Timothy 2, 1-4, to it says, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving things be made on behalf of all men, kings, and all who are in authority so that we may lo lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Why do you pray for your leaders? So that they will live a tranquil life, a quiet life, godliness, and dignity, especially for your church leaders. If you, in your life, have experienced a spiritual battle, they are in the front lines. Do you know that? Do you realize that? Spiritual battle is really real. And it is only if you try to sense it that you would realize it exists. Those little things that happen in your life, you think they're accidents, they're coincidences. Some of them are spiritual battles if you make and really sense what God is doing in your life. The more you sense the spiritual side of things, you know, the more you will know one coincidence is a spiritual battle or not. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God. It is really, you know, a sweet aroma before God for us to be praying for our church leaders who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So if you pray for your leaders, you know, if you don't pray for them, actually in the negative sense, some people will stumble and that's what the enemy wants. Many people would stumble. Many people would be discouraged. So pray for your leaders that they would be strong to live a life worthy of the life that God called them to be. Purging sin in their lives so that they would have that Christ-likeness that would be shown to the people around them. So that many people would come to the knowledge of our Jesus, for Jesus, of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Alright? In actual fact, in 1 Timothy 5.17, this is one, one, one verse that really hits me. It, it was uh, somebody, uh, somebody shared it in the D12, and I reference it here. You should give your church leaders double honor. What does that mean? The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So if you remember Pastor Ryan in your minds and hearts, in your daily job, pray for him. Because he is worthy of double honor. Do you believe that? You don't? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> I heard that. Amen. Yes. And give them double honor. Because they're do doing doubly hard for you. They're praying for you. You know, they, they risk their life. They, they make their life as pure as possible before God. For you as well. Do you know that? How does that affect you when people in the leadership of the church do bad things? When, when you see somebody gambling or you see somebody cursing in, in, in a crowd and you, you notice that oh he's actually a leader, would you be encouraged to join the church? Would you be encouraged to continue just worshipping with that person? 
Of course not. And therefore, you have to keep on praying with, for these guys. Because they are really open to attacks. If you only realize how hard it is, you would. Not until you see that one has fallen. Don't wait for that, guys. Don't wait till somebody falls, then you start to pray for them. No. Pray for them now that they would continue to be strong while they're serving in the church so that we as a church would grow more and please our God more. Is that alright? Yes. Okay, is it okay if we give a clap offering to our God? Praise God. In 1 Peter 2.21, if you notice, we are just going around 1 Peter chapter 2. In this verse 21, he says, For you have been called for this purpose, Peter saying to the Christians, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. So we are to follow Jesus' steps. That's why we keep on saying we should be Christ-like. In verse 22 it says, Who committed no sin. He did not, not, not sin at all, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And yet, and while being reviled, this was, was he was being crucified. He was being reviled. He was being spit at. He did not revile in return. Did he spoke back? Did he curse? He did no sin, guys. This is our Lord and Savior. While he was suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. So in the end, when you are submitting to authority that you cannot understand, authority that's so unreasonable, you are suffering, you would say, I would do because in the end, I would face the judge who will be the ultimate judge of my life. That I will be found righteous before him. That should be your target, to please your God. Not to uphold your career. Not to gain more riches. Or not to be popular. It's putting God first in your heart, in your life. That's what you have to do. And if you really want to honor authority, God, as I, uh, as I close, guys, you fill your heart with God's Word. Every day of your life should be a day meditating on His Word. Joshua 1, it says, you know, we should be meditating on God's Word day and night. And that is not even literal. It's actually med meditating on His Word all through the day of your life. Meditating so that what? So that you will be careful to do everything written in it. The blessing would follow, but the reason why you're meditating is that you would be careful to do everything written in it. If you want to be authorities to know what is right and what is wrong, read the Bible. All right? And what I would like to do now is maybe God is speaking to your heart. If it's you who has been touched by that message, you've heard that you've not really been obeying your authority. Maybe there's something lacking in your heart. Maybe you have not really had that encounter with the Lord. And if you're that guy, I would like to pray for you. And after that, I would also like to pray for the whole congregation. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we just lift ourselves to you, Lord. Lord, we, we know that in certain times we have failed. We have failed to submit ourselves to the proper authority. We have slandered our leaders. We have forgotten that we should be subject to them. That we should be praying for them instead. Lord, we have forgotten that there are authorities that you have established and that if we resist them, we are resisting you. But Lord, would I would like to pray, Lord, for, for those who have not really known you, that they understand now that in order to really have this power to submit to authorities, that they need you. If you're that person, would you pray this prayer with me? If you feel the need, there's a void in your heart that cannot be filled because you're looking for happiness all over the place. 
but you now realize that the only real happiness comes from the one true God who provided His only Son for our sins to be forgiven. Can you pray this prayer with me? Lord, I know that I've come short. I've tried everything I can do, every good work I can think of. But I realize that none of this actually counts. Because your standard is perfection and I cannot perfect it at all. I'm only human. That's what other people say as well. But I realize that you're a God who came here to save my life. You died on the cross for my sins to be forgiven. I therefore utter with my mouth, I believe in you, that you died for my sins, and that my sins have been forgiven through the shedding of your blood. And through your blood, I can now join you in paradise. Lord, would you help me to do the next steps? To learn about you more? Give me the desire, the time, and to surround myself with people who are people of integrity, people of righteousness, so that they can guide me towards my next steps. Lord, may you be the one that would be honored in my life. Help me, Lord, in this journey that I would take. I also would like to pray for the whole congregation. Lord, we have really come short of honoring our our authorities, oh God. In the workplace, Lord, we sometimes slander our leaders. We talk at their backs. We have not really submitted well. We are even part of the mockers destroying Lord their identity every bad bad word that we can think of comes out from our mouth and Lord we know we understand now that it's not pleasing to you help us Lord as a congregation that we would be an honoring congregation to honor you first in our hearts and minds so that we can honor people as well especially the leaders that you have established before us Lord we pray that each wife here would submit to their husband Fitting to your name. Lord, we also pray for the husbands to be treating their wives in a loving way. That they would love their wives more than ever before. That their wives, even if they are not Christians, that even if they are not following your word, that they would now know you because of the husband's love for them. Lord, we pray that this would be a loving church. We pray that the children here in this church would honor their parents as well in their everyday walk. That we would be serving our parents in love as well. Helping them in their sacrifices. Not only watching them, but doing what we can with our strength and mind and soul. Even just sacrificing our time because no, we know that our parents have sacrificed too much. And sometimes we have just watched them suffer. But Lord, would you touch the children in this church, that they would have that desire to just honor you by their actions as well, knowing that we serve a one true God who loves people, Lord, who loves our parents. And make us, Lord, everybody here, every children here as a channel of blessing to their parents, that their parents would also know you in a more radical way, in a close way, Lord, that they would really have that intimacy with you desiring Lord to grow more in you because they saw it in their children children loving the one true God Lord we would like to just offer to you the remaining time that we will have meaningful conversations that's honoring your name in whatever we do and that also as we go out of this building and as we work tomorrow and go to the places that we would be going to that your name would be honored that we would be upholding our leaders the one you have set before us that their name would not be mis- mis- misaligned, would not be maligned, but rather be honored, Lord, through us. That we would be praying more for them, that they would have a country. Lord, we would pray for their tranquil life, that they would li- live life in quietness, in diligence, and integrity. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for your message. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Thank you, Brother Paul. What a wonderful message, isn't it? Shall we rise up and let's give the Lord the praise as we sing this last song, In Christ Alone. Shall we give the Lord the biggest cheer this afternoon? 